and then start the recording so that we can make the magic happen. You know what? I'm liking this. Yeah. You know why? Because I, I go out of my way to make sure that when people are talking to me, they're like, they're looking at me. And then while I'm asking questions about nightlife, they're like, yeah, yeah. this guy's really, he's really underground. And be like, yeah, I am. <laughs> it, I really am. And, and look at you. You've got, you've got your own, you, you know. I'm very uh, loungy right now. Hold yeah. on I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling the vibe that you've set up for us tonight. It's very good. House music, deep house, smooth house. Our guest tonight is a bona fide thermometer to what's up with the four on the floor and for decades has been immersed in the Toronto scene as a DJ in clubs and warehouses, raves and patios and has rocked the airwaves for those who wanted to continue the journey on the radio. It's awesome to have him with us tonight. A Toronto original, please welcome to the utility room, Andy Roberts. <laughs> How's it going? Good. How are you? You know, it's I was thinking, literally you. Ha- you do have a utility room going on there. We're we're really here, nearly fourteen feet on the ground. It's really <laughs> happening. Yeah. I was thinking, How's you know, going? this is this is like. Have you been doing a lot of video, Zoom stuff? I don't mean like like for music, but just like in life. Like how like the last year, have you just found yourself like online, talking no, to people? Never. To, no. Honestly, like. Uh... No, I, I, I don't even like, I haven't done any sets or anything. No, like, but like, I don't know. It's kind of weird. Cause it's like, I don't, I don't see people that much anyways. So I haven't really noticed a difference that You're, much. The, but back <laughs> Other the, than not going out to eat. Other than not going out to eat. Right. I'm, I'm thinking though, when, when you were, when you were doing radio nonstop, you would have guests, you'd be in the studio with other people. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be this virtual interaction like that we're having right now. Yeah. What was the first what? ask for you to appear and play on Rhythm Method? Do you remember this? <laughs> Actually, uh, yeah, that's well. Mitch Mitch Winthrop was the guy that asked me to uh, to actually appear on that show. But uh, back then, I was DJing um, in Mississauga. Um, and the promoters that I were teaching for uh, Children of the Night used to uh, the club was called Cell Block, so they threw an event downtown. The first one they did was I think uh, Roger Sanchez at 1087. That was their and, first show. <clears throat> well, that was the first one I DJ. I actually oh, filled okay. in. I think for Peter, I filled in for Peter and Tyrone because for some reason they didn't they didn't end up showing up, but um, then the. They, they did a few events here and there. They had uh, DJ Jake's uh, spinning, who's known as Aristotle now. Uh, but there's a group of us. Uh, Matt C used to spin for them too. But then uh, New Year's, they did uh, Fingers Incorporated. So that's where I met Mitch, uh, Dave Campbell, who did uh, the Rhythm Method. Um, yeah, so, and I wasn't, I wasn't really anybody back then. So I was kind of, I was DJing before midnight, and Mitch was... Uh, no, he's sitting there chilling out, and he was supposed to go on after me if memory serves. But then he's like, "Keep going, man, keep going." And <laughs> like it was like my it was my first big gig. It was like a concert hall. That's like the ultimate yeah. nod, too, right? Yeah, yeah. So From like then, a DJ, uh, that's the ultimate nod. Yeah, then he was uh, he invited me on a show. Uh, I was still in high school. I think I was around seventeen. So I would go there and uh, guest on the show, and then uh, that's where I met uh, uh, Nick Holder. Um, I can't remember. Yeah, Dave Campbell was at the uh, concert hall. So, like, Dave Campbell was a regular DJ on that show as well. But uh, it was interesting because it was York University, and then you know, I was going out there every every. It was every Friday, and then it kind of like trailed off after a while. But I was DJing warehouse parties with them at the same time too. So, was Nick releasing music at that time? Yeah, yeah. So that was... I, had, I had already known who he was. Yeah, like yeah. So that's like so you were you like were you like you're getting into the studio and you're like, like, Hey Nick, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I got your yeah. records. <laughs> yeah. Cause even like back then, he, I think he used to be a regular guest on the show. So Mitch, uh, if memory serves, Mitch told me he used to send in like, uh, mixes to the show and then he would play them. And then I was like, Mitch, Mitch has helped out a lot of people in the scene, like more people than, uh, you know, we realized. 
But uh, I mean, I could only speak to my own experience, but if he hadn't done that, you know, my DJ career probably would have taken a different trajectory. And so like from, like from Mitch, I kind of learned like a bit of a mentorship thing through DJ, which I mean, I don't know if it still happens, but I, like, I, you know, like I always tried to bring that with me when, when I was DJing a lot, I would always, you know, like, you know, that's a, part of the guest DJ kind of thing, right? So it's like, okay, this person's good. Let's let's have them come on board at the living room on a Sunday or at the Mad, Mad Bar on a Saturday. But, uh, you know, I kind of got that from Mitch. And, uh, you know, then everything kind of progressed from there. That's why I, um, the guys uh, guys from Psychosis used to listen to that show. And then they, uh, a friend of mine um, who knew them introduced me to them. And then that's kind of how I started to, DJing the race and then from there I progressed I met up met up with Patrick Dream and uh, a place called Bliss Danny Henry and then next and all we're like DJing all the house rooms for not all the raves but like a lot of them but for me like I was I was doing warehouse parties with Mitch and Dave Campbell so I was like a little skeptical of the rave scene because I used to play a lot of techno but there was a certain turning point where I uh I think it was, somebody posted the record on uh, Facebook recently. Like that's the record that scared me away from techno. It was, I think it was like Fantasia or X99 or something like that. Because I was like, okay, that's not. I was into Detroit techno, and then the early Richie Hot and stuff, and then uh, obviously the bleepy stuff from the UK. But uh, that song there, I was like, okay, that guy went like this way. <laughs> I'm like, okay, house stuff. But. Uh, when the, like so like the rave scene kind of was going on but i didn't realize they were playing house until i saw mr c at the roller i think it was, i think it was a chemistry event at the roller palace or so it was a roller a roller rig but i can't remember what it was because those days are kind of fuzzy so anyways he was playing his whole set was house to a whole like roller skating rink full of like ravers I'm like, okay you know what there's something here so everything kind of happened at the same time and then uh yeah, we're just getting, you know, just getting booked at different events, and then uh, that's kind of how I got into the racing. But if you I, could you know, think of the key points, Andy, what were the differences that you could like that you could visually see between going from the warehouse parties to the raves? Well, I think the main point would be, uh, I think alcohol would be uh, they would shut down uh, bars at like one o'clock, so I think. Extending the bar hours kind of killed the warehouse scene a bit. But, uh, you know, the rave scene was a new type of music as well, right? So, I mean, I remember hearing, uh, go, like, one of my first warehouse parties was at 23 Hop and Mark Oliver was spinning, but he was playing house. But there wasn't that many people there. And I had a friend, uh, a friend, well, two, a couple of friends from high school that were, like, kind of tuned into that. So we would go to warehouse parties every weekend. And, uh, you know, the friends kind of split up where like half of them were still kind of doing house. And then, the other, you know, the other half kind of went uh, the rave route. But we used to go to 23 Hop all the time. And then when Psychosis uh, was throwing events there. And... Our room, like, I don't know, like probably 50, 60 times over the years. And that DJing in that room kind of honed my skills because, like, there was no... I can't remember there being a monitor. I used to like have to like cue the record and then mix it in, but take my headphones off just so I can mix off of the speakers because it was just, <laughs> just like there was no. I don't think there was a monitor there, but anyways, that helped me uh, DJ better as well. Right? It's funny that you're bringing up, um, I guess, shit gear and and mm. showing up. How often that happened? where something wasn't working. Yeah. Do you, did you have a spot that you went to where it was absolutely beautiful and everything was just kept in, in great condition and it worked the way it was, it, oh, yeah. the way it was supposed to work? What was that well, spot? I would have to say uh, it was the first time I DJed in Montreal. Where at? Because uh, Luke, Luke Raymond booked me at, uh, I think it was Playground. Right. And, you know, it was the first time, like, I'd seen, like, a three turntable set up like that, a crossover, all of that stuff. And, like, everything, like, locked in. 
like you know it was like everything was tight I'm like, you know, like i'm used to playing on like you know just you know like i don't want to like obviously Montreal's different club culture. It's, you know, more akin to New York than, uh, you know, Toronto, but like, you know, racians were just kind of like figuring it out as, as we went where I was parties too. But like, this is like next level. I was like, I'm DJing at a club right now. <laughs> what was it that inspired you to start making your own music? Were, were, were you, did you feel like you were missing a piece of, of what was happening while you were looking through your record box to DJ? Did you, did you, no. was it a contribution? Or did it... I think if I look back, like I would say I got into hip hop in like grade seven and uh, I didn't know really what I was doing, but I, I remember it was like a craft work song and I had two tape decks and I would just, it was like, um, I can't remember what it's called. I think music nonstop. I would just take the uh, the intro and just kind of record the intro in different sequences. Like it didn't make any sense. I was just like, okay, whatever. Like, boy, you know, it's the song that goes boing from Chuck. Boing. Do you remember that song? No. Uh, I don't. I don't. don't know. It's... it's just kind of like an intro. So I was just kind of mixing up the words, but I didn't do it in any real sequence or anything. Right. So when I look back, I'm like, I'm just experimenting with two tape decks for no apparent reason at all. Right. So. I looked back when I started making music. It's like, you know what? I was kind of, I was sampling back then, but I didn't even know what I was doing. <laughs> I just, I'm just interested in like, just doing, like playing with these two tapes. Yeah. So like hip, like, you know, hip hop kind of got me into uh, that. And, and then it just kind of progressed from there. And then when I, I would say in grade nine, um, I had a friend in high school, uh, John Edwards, and he was friends with uh, somebody named Mark Agnon. And a, f- a few friends of mine and myself were just getting into uh, to DJing, buying records, hip hop records. And uh, my friend Sean had a couple turntables, and another guy, Ali, had a couple turntables. And then somehow they just ended up at my house, and they just kind of stayed there. And just kind of like I used to, you know, I used to just DJ in the in my mom's basement. And then uh, John Edwards uh, introduced me to this Mark Agnon, who ended up being started from scratch. So uh, we used to DJ together, and I actually my first productions were actually at his place. And he used to, you know, he used to live near Square One. I would go over there, and we would like work on house music. And then from there, I bought, you know, I just bought my own gear and just kind of. I wouldn't even say it was a, like a, nothing was ever like a really a calling. It was just kind of like. A, it just kind of flowed. That's it. You know, it's something you wanted to do, but I wasn't really like, I don't want to be like that guy or whatever. It's just like, okay, this is cool shit. Like that. Okay. I'm in, very interested in this. And then it just kind of progressed from there. So the first piece of gear I bought was a uh, Casio CZ, no, FZ 10 M rack mount and uh, Juno, sorry. M1 key, Korg M1 keyboard. I bought that off of Mario J, I think. And then uh, <laughs> I met him back then. And then a Juno 106. And I still have all of it with my, uh, with my uh, Atari 1040. SC. You have all this gear still? Yeah, yeah. Wild. Well, I, I, had, a cat, I had a cat pee on my M1, so that was, that's no longer around. <laughs> just, just blew up all the, the electronics. So I'm like, okay, this one's done. This may sound like a funny question to ask, but what was the process like? Like, how did you submit your music to Definitive Records, that signing? How did that happen? I I mean, today, obviously, I I realize, especially for the newer audience, they might be thinking, what the fuck is this guy talking about? But but then, like, what was was it like? I was... uh... I don't know, it was just like, just put tracks together, send out some tapes, and they get back to you, they get back to you. They don't, Wait they a don't. second, you were mailing off cassette tapes with your music with your yeah. music on it because that was the way to send the demo? Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, initially, John Akaviva got back to me. It, my, my release on um, Definitive was supposed to be a couple of different tracks. So he invited me out to London 
uh, and I had to bring my sampler. And we hooked it up into a studio, but I honestly I didn't know shit back then. Wait, wait, so wait! Like, hold on for a second. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Wild. So, so let me let me get this. Let me get this going on. Like, did you include a letter when you were mailing this cassette? Like, hi, my name's Andy Roberts. This is my four track EP, and 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 if you like it, the, if you like it, give me a call. Was was that? Honestly, I I can't even remember. I just remember getting those brown envelopes and just like making a list and just sending them. So off. like, but then how, did so did John contact you himself? What did he do? Did he call you up on the phone? Do you remember this? Honestly, that part's like super fuzzy. You didn't even get like a registered letter. That's why I'm asking. Like, what what was the process like? Like, you've got the label person calling you up on the phone. I mean, it'd be an email, right? I mean, but you know, I, like. I'd be lying if I said I remembered. I could have even, like, because I was DJing raves back then, so I, I was DJing with Richie Houghton every once in a while, too, so I might have even just given it to him. I know I gave him, Richie some music, because I was originally supposed to put out this 12-inch. We couldn't get the uh, the sampler working on the mixing board, so we kind of kind of got squashed, and I sent them some more stuff. And that ended up being the, uh, the 12-inch we put out. And then... Uh, I remember I sent them some more stuff on a dat and Richie actually had picked out uh, a bunch of tracks. I think it was, it was going to be like a double 12 inch, but uh, for some reason it got squashed. So, but yeah, I, I mean like when I sent out stuff back then, just like, it just seemed logical to me. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, well let's, here's a record. I like this record label. I'm going to send them some music and see what happens. You know? So, I mean, there was like uh the stuff I did on cult records, same way. They contacted me and said, okay, great. It's amazing. Like a record label out of New York wants to put out my stuff. So I had a relationship with them for a little while, but I also sent out stuff to, I was, I was like, I was supposed to actually have a 12 uh, inch come out on Henry street. They were, they were going to sign um, the, the 12 inch that came, eventually came out on Aquarius. They had picked two of the three tracks that came out on the Aquarius uh, record that I did. But uh, the, they sent the contract to me, and I, I'd given it to Mark Quayle, who's, uh, I mean, you know who he is. He's actually uh, just helped get the uh, Dance Music um, Juno Award. Uh, set yeah, up. with Flipside and Sydney, Sydney Blue, incredible. Yeah. So I, I'd given it to him to look at the contract. And, you know, he was like, he marked it up, and he's like, this is like a Janet Jackson album contract. Like, you're like locked in <laughs> for whatever. And so I just, I just, I just sent it back to the guys at Henry Street, and then they're just like, "Yeah, you know what? Forget it." So it's like, it's that question where it's like, "Okay, should I have just said fuck it and uh, put something out on Henry Street?" Because this is right, like, uh, you know, right after the bomb, like right in that era where, like, it would have been, you know, it would have been good either way, right? But. So that didn't really work out because they, they, the guy, the guy who ran Henry Street used to work at uh, Atlantic Records. So he was just kind of like, "Fuck this!" Your lawyer's like, "Fuck it!" Barking this up too much. No deal. Did you feel like <laughs> okay. once you had these releases that they were coming out that it gave you uh, a more cemented position in in the Toronto scene? Um, I don't really think. Uh, I mean, I don't really. Like I don't want to get political. Like I don't think there was really a lot of support record stores for other people that were like. I I think that maybe not a lot of people knew that I put out records because you didn't really you didn't really see Toronto records in Toronto record stores a lot unless it's the guys working at the record stores stocking their own records. So I mean. That that was my kind of take on it, and I, it wasn't necessarily basically my records, but I, you know, it's like I, you just kind of, kind of know that like, okay, I know this guy put out this record on this label, or why isn't it on the wall here? You know what I mean? Like, but I just think, in my opinion, you're either local or you're international. So, did you feel any heat from the releases outside of Toronto? Yeah, yeah, I got some licensing. Uh, Cashmere licensed uh, one of my tracks uh, for one of his compilations. 
uh, that was on cult records. So you, you, you get it, you know, like I didn't really sell like an amazing amount of records, but I mean, I would say, you know, like I would meet people down, you know, in Miami at the winter conference. Like, oh yeah, yeah I got this record. Oh yeah. And I said, you know, whatever. There's just kind of an acknowledgement here and there. But I mean, I would, to say that I had any major hits, no, but I mean, I, I would say the best, uh, the Aquarius record that I put out, uh, I remember when I met Mr. C, he was like, yeah, I used to play, I used to cane your record on my show on the BBC all the time. <laughs> so I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> so, did did it did it have did it have a a different type of inspiration than maybe might what you thought before something like that moment might happen, like the Mister C moment? And I'm sure it wasn't the only one, you know, where you've got people coming up to you being like, "Hey, uh, I've got your record, badass, thanks." What 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 was what yeah. was that vibe? Did 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 you did you want to run back into the studio and, and be like, "Oh, fuck more." Yeah, you know, I, I feel like you're just driven, right? So I remember I did a record for uh, Dino and Terry. Uh, I did a bunch of records for them. We were really tight, and we still are. But um, all the four tracks they picked on the uh, for the EP, I did three of them in like a day and a half. Yeah, so it's like the, they caught on with like with the vibe, what, where my mind was at at that time. So, I but for me, like after that, uh, the Aquarius record, I I kind of like. Uh, things started going a little bit digital. So it took me a while to kind of adjust to, uh, to the, like, cause you're going, like you're going from like, uh, I did, like I sampled all my drums and everything. And I went from like, okay, doing that. Now I have to learn how to mix everything down, like the raw sound. So that took me a while, but I mean, it was a little intimidating even to kind of follow up to the Aquarius thing, because I felt like that was like, uh, that was really, you know, I really enjoyed making those tracks. So I don't know, like, plus I was very busy DJing, so I wasn't really that productive on the music side. So I was, uh, I think that's when I was doing the living room, Mad Bar, Element on Fridays, System on Thursdays. One, po- one point during that period, I was doing a Wednesday somewhere on Young Street, and about to carry on Mondays. And then when, were you, when were you home, Andy? When were you home? <laughs> I would go out on Tuesdays to Bamboo. <laughs> Never. So what 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 was it what was it like then? Just just being out. Did you did you find you did you want to live closer to the city? Did you live out? Did you live did you live outside the city? No, no, I was in the city. So I getting to, back uh, and yeah, getting back to walk and forth my from the shows. Back. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, sorry. Getting back and forth from the shows, did where where were you practicing? Where were you jamming to to put together new ideas, new mixes, new sounds? What as far as studio is concerned? Yeah, was or, this was this in your place, or did you have to go somewhere separate? Did you were you like all in well, the same room? Yeah, I would, I would basically just like have a setup wherever I lived. So anytime I moved, the studio was the last thing to come down and the first thing to get set up. So at one point I lived above Il Fernello and uh, I gave them my phone number because I was like, okay, if the bass is too, if you hear too much like bass, give me a call because it's right above their dining room. So I wonder the, about I mean, some of the alternative living spaces that are in <laughs> Toronto and if, if they're still like, I feel like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I was going to a lot of different house parties. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and they were always on top of a store or a restaurant, beauty salon, this type of idea, yeah, yeah. and massive sprawling spaces that you would just never ever expect. My favorite actually might be um, a couple years ago after Pride uh, on Spadina by Dundas above, and it was like three floors, this one unit, and it was just. Ma- I remember like an elevator opening up, and I was just thinking to myself, I was yeah, like, yeah. "Is this for real?" Like you would never, yeah. the building was dilapidated on the outside. It was, and it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is just a couple of years ago. So this unit is definitely still there. I mean, at least I think it is. What do I know? Nothing. Um, well, back but, in the warehouse days, that's all there was. Like these, these spaces were like all in Wellington, Portland, everything. It was like, and I found out like that they were all break-in parties. You know what I mean? Like 
Well, I didn't really realize that until like I met uh, I was throwing events with somebody who used to throw. What is parties. a break in yeah. party? Well, they would just break into an empty uh, building. Exactly, as but you sounds. you'd have to go to the Cameron House on a Wednesday, and then that's you know that's where you kind of either get a little flyer, or the word would be out where the warehouse party was going to be on the weekend, and you go there like you know Peter and Tyrone or Dino and Terry or uh, you know like. Mark and Aki and JMK. And then after I start, it's like, that's, it, and then you'd be like five, 600 people. It's like, wow. You look now how much work you have to do to like, it's, you get people to come out to an event. It's like, why do you think, like, what, what's the difference on that? Why do you think that might be? Uh, well, you know, I think it was something relatively new, but um, I mean, it's also scarcity, right? It's like there wasn't many clubs back then and there wasn't you know a lot of other options either. You know, like, you know, you're not sitting at home watching Netflix. You have to actually go to Blockbuster and like sit there and stare at the wall for an hour to pick a movie. You know what I mean? mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, you know, and, and back then, like, I the one thing I liked about it was very inclusive of everybody. You know, it was also very, you know, more of a money city. But you go to Montreal, Montreal is like still like you know driven by art because you know like you know, the cost of living is probably lower here. It's like you know everybody's driven to uh, you know. Make more money just to get by. Interesting. How many formats have you used uh, to perform? Like, what was the first thing that you started on, and then and then where did you land? Well, the the, the turntables I mentioned before they were uh, Nico uh, turntables. Nico. So I, yeah, yeah. But the other uh, <clears throat> the other uh, thing. Like, my uh, my best friend's uh, father had a tape deck with pitch, so we would also use that as well. I remember being in it like before I even had two turntables or access to two turntables. We would just have one turntable and then this tape deck with pitch, and we we're just kind of like just toying around, so just experimenting. Wow, I felt fancy with high speed dubbing. <laughs> but yeah, I mean. Like this is what I said. Everything just kind of fell into place like naturally. My first time I, I uh, played on twelve hundreds. Like I, I met I met a friend uh, named Alex in high school, and his uh, his parents owned a restaurant, and it used to be a disco club in the basement. So we would go there at lunch. And it was the first time I DJed on twelve hundreds. Go there. It was like it was just a banquet hall by then, but like the, all the disco records were in the back room, just sitting there. And I didn't know anything about like disco, but we'd go down there, mix at lunch. We'd go after school, mix at lunch. I say mix after school, and uh, yeah, was, I don't know. It's kind of like, uh, well, I'm sure you've been there. It's like you, a bit of an obsession where it's like you lose track of time, and the next thing you know, it's six o'clock in the morning, and you're like, oh shit, I gotta go to school. <laughs> How awesome was that to be able to go to a, a a spot that you were able, like, just able to reach and just jam, like, and it was an actual venue. Mm -hmm. So like you're yeah, like yeah. learning on like a, like I, I guess a real sound system, but definitely more of, above and beyond what you might have probably the average person would have at home. I'm guessing, yeah. just from the description. Well, I mean, like we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't have the sound system on because people are eating upstairs, but uh, oh. <laughs> but still, it's like yeah, I'm like twelve hundreds. Like, you know, like right. I'm like compared to the Nikos, I'm like oh my god, this is like so easy. Right, because you know the other one, you're like kind of pushing it forward and like you know, sure. <laughs> slowing it down at the same will, time. Will I ever get this matched? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think starting off on turntables like that kind of may make it easier to, to be on twelve hundreds and it, you know learning like in a an uncomfortable, shitty environment. When you get to the to the good quality equipment, you're that much better on it because you could basically. You know, account for anything. You know, any issues. Yeah. Do you miss? I mean, I'm, I'm gonna ask this. I, I, you brought something up before about how you felt that the Toronto record stores were not very supportive of the local producers at the time. But do you recall some of the other struggles of the record store, and do you miss them? I do miss going to the record store. Um... And you know the and this I think this issue is probably, I've probably happens everywhere else, but 
and I'm sure every DJ that's shopped in the record stores in Toronto could probably uh, would probably have the same kind of opinion. But I mean, I'll say this: going to like Inbeat in Montreal, Christian Pronovos was a DJ that owned that record store, and that's where I would get the best records because here's a DJ that owns a record store who has an interest in making a living selling records. So I think the issue was maybe not everybody had access to all the records that were being sold or, you know, like you kind of got a sense that uh, some records weren't being reordered because they were good. You know what I'm saying? So like, like for me, an example, for me, an example, like, Disco's Revenge. First time I heard it was uh, on the top of Salvio's in Montreal. Patrick Cream was playing. So he had uh, obviously told me what it was. And then uh, I, asked, I came to Toronto. I'm like, okay, you guys got this record? No, no, it's, it's uh, you know, they stopped pressing it. <laughs> <laughs> Just for you. But like a few certain DJs were playing it. And then I went to Chicago with um, Stop pressing uh, Gen, Gen Star. <laughs> actually, uh, DJ Griffin. Actually, what a reply. I took his plane ticket to Chicago because he couldn't make it on the trip. Then I went to uh, Gramophone. There's a whole wall full of these records. So I, what I did, I bought them all and I brought them back to Toronto and I sold them all to a cost to whoever wanted them. And you never saw that original pressing on Bumblebee Records in the Toronto record store. It's either a bootleg or a licensed version. So that's my st- that's my story that ex- would exemplify that. But I don't want to call anybody out. But I mean, no, the, I've heard the, stories. The story's fabulous as is. Yeah, I've heard that's stories great. where like somebody would who worked at a record store would order records to another, like to his father's coffee shop. And have oh. all of his friends come and get those records, but it's like I, I heard that like within the last fifteen years. I'm like, okay, that that makes sense because like I go to it well, like if I go to Montreal, obviously they're closer to differences. Like here's the guy that owns the store, and he's he's own he owns the store to make money, but you know I'm sure like he still keeps the really like rare stuff for himself. But I find the most amazing records there. Here, you know, it's like. I remember being at, um, I was going to say Star Sound, but Tracks one time. I went out, I walked out with like one record, and it's like the owner asked me, like, how come you're only buying one record? I'm like, well, oh, there's records I want. I know they're here. I just, uh, I heard them over there by the turntables, but I just can't, uh, I don't have access to them. So he went back, went through everyone, you know, tore a strip off some people, and then <laughs> he's like, here you go. <laughs> but I was like, you know, it's natural for guys, people want to hook up their boys and shit like that, but, you know, like, I, I'm, and I'm not, like, I used to write uh, reviews for uh, Peace Magazine, so oh, I would you're, have... You're, you're, ju- you're jumping ahead, it, it definitely, ha- I've got it on here, I was, but say, save your thought, don't don't jam, but, but I was... No, but this kind of, this, this kind of ties All right, what here, yeah, so you I'm go, not, I've, I'm written I, down, you're, you're, you're going on. So, I'm... like, DJ, DJs, the DJ a lot would have a box in the back, I played a record, and I, I had a box there. But that's because I, my column was sponsored by Play the Record. But you know, it's like uh, you know, it's like you, you like the whole point for me. The way I thought of it is like these these records are to promote the music or the record label, right? So I mean, did people not order good records just so they could have them? I'm sure that happened. You know what I mean? No. I mean, yeah, the optics don't look good. No, that there. doesn't make sense. I but mean, I feel, like I, feel, a... I feel your vibe. I so I, and I'm gonna. I mean, be, from my experience, because I, I was behind the desk at Eastern Block for for a couple of years. But I was there for a week or two. You you worked at Eastern Block. Yeah, yeah for a, I think a couple of weeks. Not at the same time as me, did you? I'm, but I'm saying that like this is. But we're talking about like house music here, so hey, like hey. I mean, this certain certain genre of house where like 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 Easter Block was a different type of house music. Sure, sure. We had house, but it was I guess what, what would be early tech house. Yeah. Uh, ideas, I guess, if you will. I, 
uh, that was and that was all Paul for sure, you know, because because yeah. Dakota was like there's tech another house DJ, there's a, or sorry, there's Trans a DJ that owns the record store, right? So mm-hmm. his, his he's putting his you know like he has a business. His business is to sell records. Right. Yeah. No. So, we def. That's what I was about to say. Is that we we. I mean, we were encouraged to sell. <laughs> that was definitely the idea. Yeah, yeah. Was to sell. So sell, yeah. Yeah. Sell everything. <laughs> no. Exactly. Like I. I because I worked there, I worked at the pit uh, for uh, Paul Van Toss. Paul. Yeah, yeah, Paul Van Toss. But you know, it's like, uh, and, you know, for me, um, like uh, that you guy know, got uh, in dope records. Yeah, but it, you know, it, honestly, it's like if you're working in a record store, your job is to put put like DJs on or people just on to like new records. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Obviously, s- some limited quantities, but you know, if you're hoarding stuff. You know, like why I was always of the thought that it's like I don't care if you have the same records as me. You're gonna play them differently than I am, and somebody else is gonna like the way you play them better than me, and vice versa. So, I think the internet leveled the playing field because now everything, everybody has access to everything. You know, unless unless you're you're like you know making your own stuff and playing it that nobody has access to. So. I think that might actually be the uh, the idea moving forward. Yeah, I think I think the idea, you know, there's something to be said about having music uh, that no one else has, and then and and not and not releasing it. And the only way to have access to it would be to go see the show. Yeah, no, I agree. That's like uh, I think that's something. There's something you said there. It's very exciting, obviously, because then you don't know what you're getting. You're showing up, and it's like. And if you do know the song, then you know the only way you're going to hear it again is at the show, or off of your phone, rec- yeah, yeah. or off your phone recording, or you know what I mean. Like, that's it. <laughs> it's it's that's it, it is it's an, it's an interesting thought because the accessibility does it, it's it has it's changed things. I agree with you. Like, how do you navigate? Uh, like, you know what I mean. Like, I had I had the label for about let's say maybe ten years. But it's like, uh, you know, it's just, there's so much stuff coming out, you know, and then you're kind of connected, but not, you're, you're less connected because you're not going to a record store and just hearing something randomly. You know what I mean? You're like, you have to actually seek things. It's a lot more work. And, you know, like. There's also something, I mean, on the flip of it, there's with what you just said, thinking there's something very personal about that right now as well. So that. Regardless of whatever generalized curation might be happening or what people might call super hot, there's the idea that you can do your own thing now and it really doesn't matter what's happening uh, outside of your universe. Yeah, no, I agree. That's that, cool. That, you know, so like every every person can literally be their own niche. Mm-hmm. And there's no way you can really, uh, you know, like – like other people can't really define you. A label can't define what you do. Like, you know, it's like my issue is like with making music and DJing. It's like, I was always in between genres. So I wasn't hard enough to play harder, but I wasn't deep enough to play deeper. I was always in the middle. So that's why the living room was like, kind of like the perfect, uh, you know, the perfect uh, atmosphere combination. Cause I could do both, right. you know? And, uh, so I can go harder and I can go deeper, but I mean, if you're going like, if you're, if you're kind of like stuck in the middle, you're kind of waiting for like the scene to kind of figure, figure it out. Right. So it's like, because everybody wants, everybody wants to define you. Right. So, I mean, like I was DJing a lot of clubs, but I mean, Sunday, DJing on a Sunday was the best because you you got people that actually to come out for music, not just because it was a Friday or a Saturday. And I'm sure you can, you probably had experiences like that too. No, I've but it's had like, uh, some. I feel like I don't know. Felt like sometimes it was just there was like I was on for seven days. There's been there's been some of those weeks, and then and then not. Then yeah. you're not on for three days, and those and those three days you're like you're sleeping. And that's why I was <laughs> asked. And that's why I was asking you, did you live close by? Because did you ever feel like you were packing your bags in a mad scramble? to get to the show and then, and then you get to the show and you're like, what's, what's in the box? <laughs> like, you know, I, I don't know that I, that I pack right. Like you get to the show, be like, yeah. Oh, this is not what I wanted. I, you know? 
That's yeah, that's the nightmare, right? <laughs> right. Be, uh, well, after the fifth gig and the fifth yeah. bottle, you know, you know, you're like, I, my head. I'm not. I got to get it together. How am I going to yeah, do it? But I almost try, feel like, in that sense, like you know what? It's almost more fun because less is more, right? It's like okay, <laughs> this is all I have to work with. Let me make it work because now right. it's like with you can have like. Every, every song ever made in a USB stick and you're spending more time like you know like trying to choose the perfect track instead of just being like okay let's just this this feels good right here you know what I, mean? I like I like that if, if you know, you've got you've, you're walking around with 10,000 songs we would walk around if we had two crates and, and typically that would be the that would be the look you'd always be like yeah. you see the person show up with three bags or four bags or something you'd be like hey hey <laughs> Yeah, exactly. How long, plus, how long are you playing Now it's like man? you can't be like, okay, you want to get it for free? Carry my USB stick. Right. That, yeah, that, that, that buy's <laughs> not going to work. But I'm thinking to myself that you'd have to pack the bag and you had these limited options. Like you had yeah. to make it work. Yeah. That's interesting. No, but I, I, think, never, I, I think in life. I really thought about that. Right now. In life, in life, limitations, you know, like that's what helps you grow as a person. Creative, for sure. Yeah, you've got to push some boundaries. I get into a B-side, like I never play this. What the fuck is this? I'm out of music. Oh, my God, I got to get to it right now. Yeah, but also it goes with making music. There's so many plugins now. It's like, when are you going to stop buying plugins and finish the song? <laughs> Not you personally. But... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I've had that conversation with a couple of people. Though. Yeah. Okay, that's great. You got this cool plug in. Can yeah. we finish this song? <laughs> I'm trying to challenge myself by actually staying in the box now. So it's like I'm just like everything is yeah. Ableton and Max for Live and just and just, just trying to keep it all internal just because although I yeah. I recently just did get vital and I like it a lot. Um do you were you overflowing with promos? because of your review column in National Music and Peace Magazine? Well, you know, like Peace Magazine was more of a hip hop, um, hip hop magazine, but I also like to get promos, you have to put it in the work and like send the magazine out. I didn't really do that. I basically, um, there was uh, the guy, I took over the column from uh, this guy, Ori the Heeb Sheer. And, okay. uh, and so basically, and I, I, you know, I didn't really, I'm sure if I read some of my reviews and stuff back then, I'd be like pretty cringeworthy. I was trying to be like kind of cute stuff, but, uh, right. And, and I say that was his actual name, Ori the Heeb Sheer. So I'm not trying to call him the Heeb, but, uh, anyways, he passed it on to me. It was Ori's house. So we just changed it to Andy's house. And then, uh, I, I'd say like, I got like stuff major label stuff like Saint Germain uh, the tourist album Daft Punk stuff like that I got promos of that but uh, I didn't put in the work to kind of get the promos so was, you know I was too focused on like you know I, well not I would say unfocused on DJing like uh, too many nights a week and whatever comes with it <laughs> what do you think about like firstly, how about this? I, I've got the I I have the question, and it's it's a it's a deep psychology style question, Andy. So we're going in, okay? Okay. All right. How many? Should records? I get more bourbon? <laughs> I mean, we're here, you know. Yeah, okay. How many records do you have? <clears throat> um, Guesstimate. I was very picky, so. Okay. It's not as much as you would think. So right. I'd probably say, I don't know. I thought you were getting philosophical, but you're getting mad. Uh, no, I know, because I'm, I'm, I'm about I'd probably to. say two Ikea shelves. Two <laughs> Ikea, oh, what are they called? The, cl the clisps or, or, or the... <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you, so you could probably fit like, clips. I'd probably say about five, five to 8,000 records. Okay. What but I, you know, I was, I was super. Are pissed. they laid out right now in your house, or, or is it in storage? Uh, they're laid out in my mom's basement. In you... storage. <laughs> okay, all right, then there we go. So I can't, I, I can't ask the question. Like, how often do you visit these records? Whenever I visit my mom. Really? Do you do you go? Do you, yeah, have, do you... I, you know what? I'm just, I'm just waiting for space to uh, to bring them to to the house, but. Uh, I mean, 
the space is not for, forthcoming right now. So, so I would love the, to have them. I have, okay. Like, I have all the, I have about like four or five crates of shots in the studio, but I only have one turntable right now. So, all right. No real that's, need for that's the question I was going to get to. Is I was going to ask you, what do you think? What do you think about when you're standing in front, when you're staring at your record collection, and you're standing in front of it? What are you thinking about? I'm not looking forward to the day where I have to carry these up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what I like. Honestly, I could like. You could probably attest to this. You look at every record, and there's like probably like it. You know, like it gives you a, a memory flash of like when you bought it or when you played it. You know, it's like I'll go down there every once in a while, just like go through it. If I'm doing a vinyl set, I'll go there and uh, you know, kill two birds with one stone, visit the mother, and uh, you know, get some records. Right now, my record shopping is on uh, the Monday Discovery Weekly on Spotify. <laughs> so they, I make sure nobody goes on my Spotify because, like, I keep it funky. I keep the funk and the jazz funk and the deep disco because, like, I had my son on there for a while. I was just like, okay, I can't listen to Juice World. No more Juice World, please. <laughs> <laughs> so then, basically. That's uh, you know, like I would love to, I would love to play vinyl, but you know, it's like I'll play, I'll play any format. You know, it's like it's you're you're mixing BPMs, so vinyl does feel better, more fun as a DJ. But I mean, DJing's just fun. You know, when it's when it's fun, it's fun. You know, and when it's not, it's kind of like it sucks. <laughs> it sounds, it sounds like you're still having fun. Here's the uh, here's the moment where. I like to put the guests in the hot seat and ask the most challenging question of our talk tonight. <laughs> Are you ready? Is that the question? <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yes. <laughs> You've got three records that you know you love. Yeah, yeah. They are your records. You count on them to either rescue a floor in a time of need or just when things are going off and popping in some fashion, you're like, woo, these are going to work no matter what. What are these three records? I could have sent me this before we did this. No, oh, man. That, <laughs> we are. We, I, I'm not saying we are live, but we're actually, we are pre-recorded live. Uh, we're broadcast. We're streaming live in a, in a pre-recorded uh, world. I thought you were going to do the Desert Island question. No. Um, Although, you know, I guess it's, it, it's, in yeah. that, it's in that it's in that universe. Yeah. I'm going to go on the memory banks now. Is, 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 so, it gonna, well, is it going to be okay, Andy? I, I don't want to hurt you. No. Um. I'd say so. You're just saying like surefire tracks that'll like uh, you know you know, know you know these records. What. You know these records. They're 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 the type of thing like like we've all been there as DJs. We have the oh shit moment. We either knock the yeah. tone arm, click the power switch, knock out a power supply. Go, Hi, I've done that. You know it, all kinds of maneuvers or things that happen that either stop your set or just a, a, a an absolute garbage mix. You know, you're, you, you've absolutely destroyed uh, 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 the dance floor's going off, but you laid down the wrong track. So there's a, there you go, you turn around, you go into your box and you yeah. do your flip and you know, you know that if you pull this out, you're back. <laughs> what is that record? Oh, it'd be easier if I was still DJing a lot. Um, I would say, uh, Love Hanover by uh, Pauline Henry. It's uh, the Todd Terry remix would be one of them. Um, <sighs> Excellent. Love it. Uh, I'd say maybe Club Lonely by Lil Lewis. Um, Classics book. Oh, so many errors eras that I've DJed through that they're going through my head. Right. Um, 
，我饶恕的，我饶恕的。嗯 ，No, I I would say if it was the rave scene, Energy Flash by Joey Beltran. Ah,、oh, it is the one. <laughs> It's super dope, a great. Yeah. Do you've got some? You've got some archive sessions, uh, like DJ sessions somewhere that people could check out. Yeah,、uh, I, I occasionally I post stuff on Mixcloud. I'm just I, I actually posted a mix、uh, last week of a set that we、uh, we did in high school. The mixing was atrocious, but it was just like three turntables, that tape deck I was talking about earlier with the pitch. But we 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 used to listen to this show called Oblivion Express on CKLN. And then the guy would have like sayings, just kind of while he was mixing over and over again. I can't remember the DJ's name, but it, the show ended up like morphing into Fear Edit. But、um, so we kind of did the same thing. We take sayings over and over again. We called it the Oscar the Grouch tape, and we started off with like、uh, the Sesame Street record. So we had,、uh, you know, my friend's father's reverb machine, his tape deck, and we would literally like. Re- Record sayings over and over again, and write down the number that it would be on. The, so you hit reset when the tape's at zero. It'll be zero zero zero. So like, okay, we're gonna fast forward to like one one two one, and we're gonna get this sample, and then we're gonna put that in while you're mixing and stuff like that. So I posted like、uh, side A of that on Mixcloud last week, but I posted it and I was like, worse than all, like you know, it's like pretty much probably like I'd say it'd be like sixteen, like. Seventeen, but you know, it's a fun set to listen to because, like, the best part is like there was a bleepy techno track that was I can't remember what it's called. I think it was called Third Encounters or whatever. Like,、uh, I think that sci-fi movie,、uh, Encounters of the Close Kind or whatever. But it was like a techno encounter- track.、Uh, a Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Yeah, so it was like a techno track that was based on that. <laughs> So we had that, and we were going back and forth with that intro and the actual soundtrack. So I listened to it. I'm like, oh, this is too ridiculous. I'm going to post.、It. So it's like probably like 15 minutes into the mix, but it's like techno, and then it's like close encounters of the third kind, and then back to the techno track, and back to close encounters of the third kind, and then、uh, you know, there's a bunch of old, early like plus eight stuff on there, like、uh, early warp stuff, but. So, so this is but, this you know, DJ Andy Roberts on Mixcloud. Yeah, yeah. So every once in a while, I'll just like if I come if I'm listening to a set, I'm like, yeah, maybe I'll upload it. So there's some stuff, living room stuff, some early warehouse stuff there. And like I said, some high school stuff, the shitty mixing. <laughs> so what about what about the original tracks? Is this stuff on Spotify now? Apple Music? Can people stream your classics? But like the classics that I play. Yeah. Or... No. No. Like your actual, your actual music. Um, I know some of like the cult records stuff is on there. I don't think the the Dino Terry crash records stuff is. I haven't really, I haven't really checked about the Aquarius stuff, but、uh, some of it's on there. Not all of it, but um. So mix signal, we like. I mean, I shut down the label. Like,、uh, well, I put it on pause, like four or five years ago. But、uh, we got some mix signal stuff on there too, and、uh, you know, but like, I'm still making music, so I'll probably get some new stuff on there. But I'm more on like trying to do like some discoy hybrid stuff. But if, like I don't want to do new disco. I don't. I don't want to do house. I just find it's more inspiring that that I start music as just like okay, let's just make some music. I don't want to make a house track. I don't want to make this or that. But let's see where it goes, and this is the direction I kind of want to go in it. Get away from the sample stuff, and just you know, just try and make some interesting something interesting to me. And you alluded to it earlier. Everybody, you know, like that's why I said everybody's going to be their own niche. There's no need for record labels anymore, really. Unless you want,、uh, you know, want some recognition for the ones that are kind of getting that shine, right? Maybe But, I'm. I, it, it, I feel. I feel like I'm not quite sure there is 
there is one way anymore. There's just so many different avenues now that's that someone could could go on and, and have success on one platform, for example, but not much on another. You know, like uh, I, I I I don't know. I, I don't. I'm not quite sure. Maybe I'm doing it wrong, but I can't seem to get Utility Room very excited on on um, on YouTube. But meanwhile, meanwhile on 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 Facebook or or the or the podcast, it's like you know, bam, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's some platforms I feel like some stuff works and and then and and it doesn't on on others. It's and I think yeah. that's a lot about you know people maybe being niche about the platforms that they that they like. They reach out and they find a community. They become part of that community on that platform and and that becomes their platform of choice. Yeah, no, I. I... I agree, but what you're doing, uh, you know, it's it's a good idea. Like people should be talking more about uh, the history of things, anyways. But uh, you know, and how how are things going to move forward? You know what I mean? We, you know, it's like like how like how are younger people going to know what what happened before unless there's a documentation of it, right? And maybe it's inspiring to somebody, and you know, like you know, like. There's always going to be a scene coming up somewhere. You know what I mean? Like like the warehouse scene or the scene that you came up in. It's just, you know, it's just they, younger people have to dictate it. I saw, like, I saw the warehouse, like, oh, the all ages scene to the warehouse scene, the rave scene to the club scene. I saw from the begin, my beginning to, I don't want to say my ending, but like, where my plateau was, and you know, I'm satisfied with uh, everything that that went down. You know, had a few shitty sets here and there, but <laughs> <laughs> they were overall good. But you know, it's like everything that happened was very serendipitous. You know, it's just you know, you kind of, you know, I hope you know, I hope other people have as much fun as I did, or still, you know, still do. I pick and choose a bit more now, right? But like, that's wonderful, Andy. You know, it's, you know, like I have an eight-year-old son. You know, like if he if he gets into this or something, I fully support it. It's just you know, I'll have to warn him about the pitfalls, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> yeah, I really yeah. appreciate you coming on the show tonight and sharing, you know, the journey, the adventure, yeah, yeah. and so, and some and some funny moments. It was it was great to to go back and forth with you, and yeah, yeah. Uh, I appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot. Oh. Thanks for thinking of having me on. I appreciate it. I don't think we could tell a story about house music in Toronto without including you, Andy. Well, and, and that's who's been with us, man. All of you out there are absolutely super fabulous, including our guest tonight, Mr. Andy Roberts, here with us in the utility room. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, do all the things that make the room go boom, and we will see you on Saturday.